Well, hello again. This is Pastor Michelle Allen from First Presbyterian Church here in Williamstown, New Jersey. Welcome back, and uh, God bless you. God be with you. Uh, may the peace of Christ be dwelling in you deeply and richly, and may you be learning from his word and uh, sensing his presence and the Holy Spirit through your prayer time with the Lord Jesus. I pray that your walk with him is, is making you stronger and um, helping you to grow in uh, peace and hope and love. Today I wanted to ask you a question, a question that probably is on a lot of people's minds uh, for a long time now, and that is, when are you going to be ready to get back out into the world? Now we've been through this pandemic, uh, we've, we've heard a lot about it, we've learned a lot about this virus, uh, we've uh, been made aware of um, what it can do to a human being. Um, we've heard about all kinds of medicines that are being used and treatments. Uh, we've heard about uh, the many ways in which you might be able to catch it, uh, the many things that you can do in order to not catch it. Um, we've heard of uh, highs and lows, um, different countries, different ways of handling things. I'm just wondering, what are your thoughts on uh, when will you be ready to re-engage with the world? I know some of you have been engaging right along the way, uh, that you really have not changed that much in your way of life, even though there's been the pandemic going on. Others have uh, curtailed their activities to a great extent, to the point where maybe they haven't left home very much at all, uh, and perhaps even now are, are getting shy about doing that because there are reports of so many uh, positive tests coming back. So um, I wonder, you know, what, what would you do? My own personal opinion is, um, or my own personal take on it is, um, you know, what do we do when there's some kind of contagious illness passing around? What have we done in the past? Whether it's been an epidemic of pneumonia, or whether it's been an epidemic of the flu, or some kind of other virus. Uh, you know, we hear that almost almost every year, uh, you know, when people get their flu shots or their pneumonia shots or, um, you know, how do you handle that? Um, how do you prepare? How do you live life in the midst of that kind of uh, knowledge of uh, contagious illnesses? And there are quite a few of them. COVID-19 is certainly not the only one that's out there. And, um, you know, I, I have been sharing with people my thoughts that um, the way I look at it is it's not a matter of if I'm going to get it, it's a matter of when. Just like I have a good shot of getting who knows how many different kinds of illnesses that have been floating around for years, um, things that we're maybe more familiar with. I remember when I was in college, um, I had been tested for TB um, many times before that. Of course, if you were like me, you grew up in uh, elementary school and middle school and high school and you got your TB test. Remember that skin test where they put the needle under the skin and you waited to see if you were going to get a reaction to it. And I remember when I was in college and uh, away from home and that was the first time that I tested positive for TB. And I thought, oh my goodness, what does that mean? And they reassured me. They said, well, that means you've been exposed. doesn't mean that you have TB, but you have the antibodies in you. And I remember my aunt always telling me, she said she was a lab tech uh, when she was working and uh, retired from that work. And she used to tell me, listen, if they ever need somebody to go work in a lab, uh, they would like you and me. Of course, she had tested positive for TB and so had my dad. And uh, she said, because we already have the antibodies. And that means that uh, we would probably uh, have a better chance than others who didn't have them uh, in not getting the illness. So, um, you know, it's very interesting uh, that, you know, we have to be prepared. Uh, you know, it, eventually you have to get back out into the world. You have to re-engage, whether it's going back to work or whether it's sending the kids to the uh, preschools, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, being out doing things again, uh, getting back into a normal way of life. And a lot of people are scared, um, but I try and look at it this way. It's not a matter of if I'm going to get it. I have the mindset of it's going to be a matter of when I'm going to get it. So what can I do knowing that I will probably be exposed to it at some point? And what can I best do to be prepared for that? And of course, 
you know, physically speaking, um, you know, we know what it takes to be as healthy as possible. It means eating well. Uh, it means cutting out a lot of junk food, food that really isn't going to help my body uh, build up uh, for a sickness, to fight a sickness. That rest is very important, uh, not to overdo it and expand, uh, expend myself to the point of exhaustion, uh, to know when my body and my mind are telling me I need a rest. Uh, so there's rest, there's uh, good eating habits. Of course, there's certain foods that do help our immune systems build up better than others. Um, and exercise. I know for some people during the pandemic, it's been uh, feast or famine. Some people have said, okay, I'm gonna do my exercise regimen because I don't have much else to focus in on right now. And others have said, nah, you know, uh, I don't know how else to deal with this, so I'm not really gonna do much of anything. I'm gonna just veg. But, you know, we all know the basics of being healthy and that sometimes that's the best you can do. But as a Christian, we know there's a whole other dimension to our being, that it's not just the physical piece, but it's also the spiritual piece. So spiritually, what can you do? Well, let me let me share you with you a story. And I know some of you uh, are probably very familiar with this. It's the story of Daniel. And if you remember in the Old Testament, there's an entire book uh, about Daniel. And he became one of the prophets uh, for God's people. And the story of Daniel is uh, that Daniel was in Judah. And of course, uh, toward the end of the statehood of Judah, that nation was overrun by uh, the Babylonians. And when the Babylonians took over Judah, they also took people from Judah and brought them back to their country uh, so that they could work there. So basically they were enslaved in many ways. And so four of the guys that he took with him were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And they must have been buddies. And they were young guys. And uh, they even changed their names. So they had to go to a different country, which was probably hard enough. But then they were given different names. And then on top of that, uh, they were going to be fed by the king. And the king had a certain diet that everybody ate, including wine and rich foods. And Daniel knew that some of the foods that they were going to be offered were foods that God said, don't eat. So now he's really in a dilemma because he's trying to hold on to at least his faith, even though everything else has changed around him. And so he talks to the fella in charge of the menu. <laughs> and he says, listen, we, we can't eat that. Uh, my buddies and I uh, are not allowed to. We, it's our religious belief not to eat that. So um, the official uh, it says, has compassion for Daniel. And he says, just so you know, I'm afraid of the king, um, who's who's the one who assigns the food. And uh, he says, I'm afraid that it's going to affect your appearance. And uh, then he says, you know, the king's going to come after me because I'm the one who's supposed to be in charge of that. But Daniel says to the official, he says, please give us uh, some time. Give us 10 days and let us eat nothing but vegetables and let us drink nothing but water, and then come and look at us and see if we're in good shape or not. And of course, uh, the fella agrees to do that. And the Bible says uh, that at the end of the 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. So then he allows them to uh, maintain that diet. Now I know there are people who say, well, that there you go. Vegetarians, they're right. I, this story is not a pro-vegetarian or anti-vegetarian story. It's about a deeper thing going on here, and that's someone who, despite all of the odds against him, beside, despite all of the changes that he faced, uh, despite the fact that he could have just given in and said, listen, nah, how can God expect me to follow my beliefs in a, in a, a different country when I'm enslaved, um, I'm forced to do things that uh, uh, even the king you know, is saying uh, I need to do. But he didn't. He held to his beliefs. And of course, uh, it says that they actually uh, were looking healthier and were better nourished uh, because they didn't want to be defiled by the king's food. It wasn't the food that did it, because if you read on later, um, to these, it says in verse 17 in the first chapter, to these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding and all kinds of literature and learning. And Daniel could understand visions 
and dreams of all kinds. So it says that God gives them these things. Now, would God have given those things if they had disobeyed God's rules? Well, chances are probably not. Um, God can do whatever he wants, but um, you know, these were people whom God noticed. He said, oh, here are people who care about my word and they care about living the way that I say to live. So I'm going to give them a lot of extras here. And it says uh, that the, at the end of the time that they needed, I guess, to be in training, the king uh, brought them into his service and he found none equal in his whole line of service than those four fellows. And they entered his, the king's service. And it says in verse 20, in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them 10 times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. God took care of them in the midst of a foreign country, in the midst of uh, great loss uh, to them, uh, and enslavement uh, in this foreign country. And it was because they heeded what God said. For us to be prepared, uh, to be able to fight or to endure uh, even sicknesses, there's the physical side, of course, but there's the spiritual side. You know, how much is God in the picture for us? Uh, do we pray daily and seek spiritual strength that way? Are we reading God's word? Lord knows we've had more time to do both of those things, but have we actually done them? Because when you show God that kind of respect in your life, God is generous to you as well. And so I think, uh, when are we going to be ready? When are some people going to be ready to go back out? I think it's going to depend on how much of God's word people have been reading. I think it's how much prayer people have been uh, setting aside time for and seeking what God wants. I think it's also going to be uh, those two things, most importantly, that will set us up in the best way to be prepared um, to re-engage and to help us uh, not just physically but spiritually um, because as I said I think it's not a matter of if I'm going to get a virus but uh, a matter of when I mean we get sick every now and then Almost, you know some people get sick every year with certain bugs uh, ask the teachers uh, <laughs> those poor men and women you know get exposed to everything uh, because they're around the kids all the time uh, but you know each one of us uh, will get a sickness and I forget what the percentages are that they expect that people will get COVID-19 and of course we know, I think the percentages of surviving COVID are up in the high 90s. So even though the news always wants to stress, you know, the, the most um, outrageous stories or uh, the most uh, headline grabbing news uh, to get our attention, um, you know, when you look at the numbers and the facts, um, yes, it's a dangerous disease, but it isn't the only one out there. And uh, we should be best prepared for any Thing that challenges our faith, our, our health, and that comes across in how we live out our faith. So just some thoughts for you. Um, of course, uh, not just seeking God alone, not just praying alone, but knowing that you are prayed for as well, and that uh, each one of you uh, comes across my prayer list uh, on a regular basis and asking God to give you strength and protection and peace uh, so that when you do re-engage, that you will be able to do so in a very healthy way, physically and spiritually. So let's pray together on that. Lord, we know that uh, even you talked about being prepared to go into battle and that the battle is, is not just uh, worldly and it's not just physical, but it's a very spiritual battle. And that whatever captures our minds and our hearts is talking to us spiritually. Lord, help us to be prepared. Help us to not be afraid. Help us to do all that we can do. Leaning on you and your word, seeking your wisdom and your understanding, seeking your presence through prayer, the peace that passes all understanding that only you can give. Help us to put both of those things out there first and foremost in our lives 
and that you will teach us the way we should go. And that when you say, this is the way, walk in it, help us to obediently follow you. In your precious name we pray, Lord. Amen. God bless you and keep you.